Well, good morning. Welcome to Villiersdorp Community Church. My name is Trevor Vecker, and I'll be standing in for our pastor, Peter de Villiers, this morning. I'm going to be starting a little series on the introduction to the book of Genesis. And so if you do have your Bibles with you, please won't you turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 and to the first few verses. But first, let's pray as we come to God's word. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that every word is true from beginning to end, that your word is reliable, that it's profitable for training, for correcting, for rebuking, so that the man and the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Speak to our hearts this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, in his sermon, Indescribable, Louis Giglio sought to kind of capture the, the wonder and the beauty of God's good creation. And he, in that sermon, he takes us on a journey through the cosmos, through the universe, and he shows the beauty of the, the far-flung galaxies hurtling through space. He shows um, stars that are so big that they boggle your mind. That's a great sermon, one of the greats of our day. And I thought of taking a similar approach this morning uh, in, in our introduction to this little series on Genesis. I looked up some things on the internet and I found that our sun, for example, gives off a trillion times more energy than the nuclear bomb the Americans dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. It does so every second. And our sun is only one of a hundred billion in our galaxy alone. And there are about two trillion galaxies in the universe. I mean, it's all mind-blowing, isn't it? It would make a great introduction to Genesis. Our God is indeed, as Louis Giglio entitled, he titled his sermon, indescribable. But then I realized that the, the description in these, these opening verses of creation here is by far, by far, even more indescribable. It's unsurpassed. You cannot get a better introduction to the Word of God. You know, one of the marvels of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 in particular, is really that a, that a child, a young child, can understand it. And yet, it, it is so profound that, that even the greatest minds fail to plumb its depths. Simple, yet profound. It's the beginning of a book about beginnings. It's what the word Genesis means. Genesis is a book that shapes our view of the world. It gives us the basis of knowing right from wrong. It tells us what is wrong with us and how it will be made right. It tells us, uh, or it stands as a beacon of truth against uh, opposing worldviews. And chapter 1 sets the stage. It goes without saying, of course, that it doesn't use scientific language. And now, it's not that it contradicts science. It's just that it doesn't use modern scientific terms to explain creation. I mean, that goes without saying. Now, if God had taken a scientific approach, well, Genesis would be inaccessible then to most people. But it's not the way God works. Like God speaks to us in a way that we can understand. John Calvin called it baby talk. That's still the truth. It's like when you visit your doctor. You know, if he's a good doctor, he will tell you with what's wrong with you, not in highfalutin medical terms. No, he'll tell you what's wrong with you in a way that you can understand. And it's the same with Genesis. It tells us what really happened. It's a true historical record of creation. It's not poetry, it's not myth, it's real history. It really happened. But it's written in a way that we can understand. Now, as with all language, the author, whom we, we believe is Moses, 
makes use of metaphors and, and themes to tell his story. He writes, for example, from the perspective of an earth dweller. To him, the earth is the center of the universe. Now, he's not wrong in that. You know, scientifically, I mean, we know that our planet is tucked away in some uh, obscure place in, in one of the outer spirals of our galaxy. Uh, there's that stunning picture that was taken back in 1990 by the spacecraft Voyager 1, which by then was about 6 billion kilometers away from Earth. And it looked back on Earth and it took this, this picture. And all you see are bands, but in the middle of the bands there's this, this pale blue dot. And that is Earth. And it seems so insignificant. And so, yes, scientists may say that the Earth is not the center of the universe. But, but in doing so, they really like, they kind of like estate agents trying to sell you property. You know, the value of property is in location, location, location. Well, the location of planet Earth might seem insignificant to scientists. But it's not where its value comes from. No, its value comes from God. It comes from God who is central to the unfolding drama of this creation story. I mean, he in fact dominates the story in Genesis chapter 1. God is in fact mentioned 35 times in this chapter. And it's what the author wants us to know. It's what the author wants us to walk away with. The story is all about God. And verses 1 and 2 is this brilliant introduction to God himself. And so I would like to highlight three things in, 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 my, in my sermon this morning. The first is what the theologian Don Carson calls the God who is. The second is the God who creates. And the third, the God who orders. Now let's begin, though, by going on a, a little bit of a, a mind journey. Let's travel through time, as it were. Let's, let's go back to the beginning of time, time as we know it. Let's go to, the, to that very moment where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I mean, can you picture yourself there? And what, what do you think you would experience if you were there? Well, Louis Giglio said it would be terrifying. In fact, indescribable. But dear friends, let's not stop our journey there. Let's cross that barrier in time and space to, to what existed before that moment. Can you do that? That mind journey? Let's, let's go to that moment before time as, it, as we know it began. Now what would you and I find? Well, we wouldn't find matter or energy or atoms or molecules or, or even space itself. There would be nothing. Nothing. Now you and I battle to wrap our minds around the concept of nothing. Now nothing is the absence of anything. Would we find that? Well, not entirely, would we? We wouldn't find nothing. Not at all. You would find God. Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God. See, it's the first thing I want to highlight. I've called it the God who is. He just is. He has always been and he will always be. There's no explanation for him. And the author offers none. God just is. There was never a moment when God was not. He's the eternal God, the great I am. 
His power, His beauty, His majesty, and His glory was known to no one but to God himself, as he existed in himself. There was nothing else but God. That is until Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, when God begins this great drama of creation. And so while the, the author offers no explanation for God, what, what he does do is he gives us a little glimpse into the being of God. And, and mind you, it's only a glimpse, a deep understanding of, of who God is, the being of God, as it were, come, will come as the scriptures unfold and as they reveal more and more of, of God in the Bible. And it, it will shine in passages like the one read to us from God, John's Gospel, especially on the role of the Son in creation. But in Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, what we find here is only a glimpse. It's a flicker, it's a, it's a glimmer. Let me explain. See, the, the Hebrew word, and I'm aware that, that some scholars will dispute what I'm saying, but there's a Hebrew word that is used for God here called Elohim, which is a plural word. Whereas the verb for created is actually singular. Now later on in, in, in chapter 1, towards the end of chapter 1, when God creates Adam and Eve, God will say, let us create man in our image. See, God uses the plural pronoun. It means there's a plurality in God himself. And we... We see that in verse 2, in fact, where the activity of the Spirit of God is seen as distinct. It says there, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And so what we find here is a glimpse into the very nature of the being of God himself. There's a plurality in God. Now we know this, don't we? In the unfolding revelation of the Bible, we know that God reveals himself as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, but one God, eternally coexistent in three persons. And so the first thing we discover on our journey is the God who is. The God who is incomprehensible in being and shrouded in mystery he has always been and will always be he's the eternal god now you might wonder how your discovery or my discovery of the god who is affects your everyday life i mean this all seems a little bit philosophical doesn't it why not just leave it for the theologians and philosophers to discuss? Why does it matter to me? How does it affect me? Well, let me, let me say this. Knowing the God who is, is the most important, practical, and fundamentally important thing you'll ever know in your life. See, the study of the God who is, which is what we call theology, is the highest thing you can study. There's no greater knowledge than knowing God. Now let's, you and I, just scratch, just scratch the surface a little of what it means to know God. Firstly, the God who is never changes. We've, you and I can find great comfort in that. It means that we can trust him. You see, he is, he has been, and he always will be. He's the one constant in our world. And that's a great comfort in a world that is in constant flux, in, that is constantly changing. It's a great comfort in a world that is, that is torn apart by war and by conflict. The God who is 
never changes. Secondly, the God who is, is distinct and separate from his creation. Now that is a very important thing to understand on a practical level. I mean, you will meet people out there who believe that creation is an extension of God or that God is somehow in his creation or, or that creation itself is God. Uh, you will hear people say things like, oh, well, I, you know, I meet with God in nature. And that sounds very spiritual, doesn't it? But it's not. It's pagan. See, pagan religion worships nature. Pagans see earth as a living mother, as divine. Now this verse here, this little introduction, is the antidote to that worldview. God is distinct from his creation. Creation is dependent on God. Its creation is not part of God. Now how do we know that? Well, we know it because of this little introduction. Of in the God who is. He existed before creation came into being. Thirdly, it's of immense practical value in that it leads to worship. See, knowledge of God is not dry and academic. Not at all. It leads to worship. Heart-stopping, awe-inspiring, mind-blowing, life-changing, never-ending worship. See, there's no one like the God who is. Majestic, all-powerful, eternal, unchanging, needing nothing, dependent on nothing. He is the God who is. Now, the second thing I'd like to highlight this morning is that he is the God who creates. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this little phrase here of the heavens and the earth literally means everything. The, the heavens and the earth, this language of the heavens and the earth, are the two opposites of a spectrum where everything in between is included. See, it's not just the starry host and the galaxies hurtling through space. It's not just the earth and all that it contains. It's literally everything. It includes things seen and unseen. It includes the angelic host and the unseen powers. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians 1 and verse 16, which is, which is really a kind of New Testament commentary on Genesis 1 verse 1. Now, in speaking of Jesus here, yes, yes, great insight, isn't it, into Genesis 1 and verse 1 and 2. In speaking of Jesus, Paul says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. I mean, they're, they're those two opposites, aren't they, in the spectrum. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. And Paul goes on to say, Things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created uh, through him and for him. So you want to know when God created the angels, when God created the devil and, and the angelic host, the principalities, the powers? Well, here is when. Genesis 1 verse 1. Here's when God created everything. Every atom, every electron, every star, every planet, every far-flung galaxy. See, he's God the creator. Now, once again, it's not some dry, dusty doctrine that's tucked away on some dry, dusty bookshelf where you go to when you're bored. It's not for some dry, dusty theologians and philosophers to discuss in their dry and dusty ivory towers. And not at all. There's huge practical value. Firstly, just as in knowing who God, the God who is, leads to worship, so knowing the God who creates also leads to worship. 
See, the Bible is full of poems and, and songs of praise to the God who creates. I mean, read Job 38, for example, or Psalm 19, or, or Psalm 33. But here, dear friends, we must be careful. You see, worship is not just a song. Worship is living the whole of your life in absolute awe, in fear, in love for the God who is, and for the God who creates. He holds your life, your very life in his hands. You know, the next beat of your heart or the air that rushes into your lungs is under his control. And so the psalmist writes, Let the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. And so, dear friends, how we how we need in our day to, to recapture this view of God, our view of God, the biblical view of God. You know, sadly and tragically nowadays, many have exchanged this high view of God for a kind of domesticated God. Now, what they have exchanged the God of the Bible for is kind of a God whom they have on a leash. You know, I sat in a room some years ago where the preacher at the time stomped his foot on the ground and demanded that that God would heal the person that, who stood in front of him. And he even went so far as to threaten God that he would give up his ministry if God didn't heal this person. And as he did so, I cringed inside. I thought to myself, oh, dear fellow, you have absolutely no idea of the God you are speaking to. You know, there's a story in C.S. Lewis's uh, little book called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where, where Lucy, one of the characters, asks Mr. Beaver if Aslan the lion is safe. And Mr. Beaver answers her, Safe? No, he's not safe. He's not a tame lion. And then he adds, But he is good. And that's how we know God. You see, he's not safe. He's, he's not a tame God. But he is good. He's God, the creator of heaven and earth. As the psalmist says, let the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Now thirdly, knowing the God who creates has immense value in answering some of the worldviews that are current. I mean, material, materialism, for example, is one of them. Material is sometimes taught in schools and varsity. And, and what, it, what it is, it has the idea that matter or the material world is all that there is. What you see, you see, whether it's with a naked eye or with, through the, the, the microscope, what you see is real. And what you don't is not. And so in the, in the equation, well, you see, God is left out. And Carl Sagan, the, the famous cosmo cosmologist, well, he captured this kind of thinking in the opening line of his bestseller, Cosmos, where he said, the cosmos is all that there is, or has been, or will be. Genesis 1 verse 1 says there is a lie. It's not true. There was a beginning to the cosmos. There was a beginning to the universe. See, the universe, the cosmos, is not eternal. Only God is eternal. Now, many scientists today will agree that the universe is not eternal. They might not believe in God, but they believe, and they would agree that the universe is eternal. They know it had a beginning. The problem they had or many of them have, is to explain how it came out of nothing. It's because scientifically and philosophically, it's impossible that matter or something can come out of nothing. You know, John Lennox, who many of you will know him, is a professor of mathematics at Oxford University. He's also a fellow in the philosophy of science. 
And, and he, John Lennox says that he doesn't have the faith to be an atheist. And his reason is this, that you cannot get something out of nothing. And dear friends, we have the answer. It's in our text. It's in this little introduction. God created the heavens and the earth. And that shapes our view of the world. And the third thing to highlight is what I've called the God who orders. That is, he brings order out of disorder. Have a look at verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. See, that is a picture of disorder, of chaos. In fact, kind of the same language is used uh, in the flood of Noah. It's a picture of disorder. Now, it's logical. I mean, it's logical that if matter cannot come out of nothing, then neither can matter shape itself into something. See, matter is matter. It has no mind. It has no determination. It has no purpose or direction, as if to say, this is where I'm going. It's like a blob of clay thrown onto a spinning wheel of a potter. You know, that blob of clay has as much chance of shaping itself into a pot as it has of singing in Kosi Sikileli Africa. Or, if you're a Brit, singing God Save the Queen. God Save the King, at least. You see, matter is matter. It has no power or mind to shape itself. I mean, that lump of clay needs the potter's hand to shape it and mold it. It needs the potter's mind to make it into a pot. That's what we read in verse 2. See, the earth was without form and void. It was a lump of clay, as it were. It needed to be shaped and molded. And it's what we see here in the beginning where it says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. See, God was about to begin to, to shape. And what does God do? Well, he speaks. See, God speaks. And he begins to, he begins to bring order out of disorder. And it's what the rest of chapter 1 is all about. See, and it uses language that we can understand. As Calvin said, baby talk. It describes in simple terms the work of God in creation. The work of God the Father, the work of God the Son, and the work of God the Holy Spirit. See verses 1 and 2. He is the God who is. He is the God who creates. And he is the God who brings about order out of disorder. And once again, how can we apply this text to ourselves? Well, the way we can do that is by seeing how God is at work today in a similar way. Not in, the, not in the creation of a physical world, no, not at all. God stopped his work of creating after the sixth day. God brought about order out of disorder. And then God looked at his creation and he declared it to be very good. And so on the seventh day, God rested. But then, sin entered our world. And with it, disorder and chaos. And so the question is then, well, how does God bring about order to the disorder caused by sin? Well, that's what the rest of the Bible is all about. See, God will again speak. This time, however, he will speak through his living word, through Jesus Christ, whom he sent into our world. Jesus, the living word, the word of God, who was with God in the beginning, and whom God sent into our world. Jesus will bring order out of the chaos of sin. And he did so by dying on the cross for sinners like you and me. And so his life, his death, his resurrection was indeed the beginning of the new creation. A beginning that will 
one day culminate in the new heavens and the new earth. But a beginning that he began through his work and his life. And then when you and I put our trust in him, we become part of the new creation, of that new order. And that happens. And here we find again a, a beautiful parallel. You read 2 Corinthians chapter 4. That happens when the, when the Holy Spirit once again hovers, not over the waters, but over a dark and sinful heart. And just like in Genesis, he speaks. And he speaks light and sheds light into that darkness. And, and he brings that heart, that person to put their trust in, in Jesus Christ. See, there might be some out there who believe that, that we here at VCC don't believe in miracles. Oh, they're so wrong, aren't they? You can't believe in Genesis chapter 1 and not believe in miracles. I mean, God is the indescribable God, the wonder-working, the miracle-working God. We marvel at his creation. We marvel at his size and complexity. We marvel that God made it out of nothing. I mean, there's nothing impossible for God. We certainly believe in miracles. But, dear friends, there's no greater miracle than the work of the new creation. A work that begins when someone comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's, you and I, pray for our friends, for our unbelieving friends. Let's Pray for that miracle to take place. Let's pray that they will come to put their, their trust in the God who is, the God who creates and who brings order. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit will shine his light in their hearts and that they will come to know and to trust in Jesus Christ, whom God sent into our world to die for sinners and then to begin this wonderful work of the new creation in them. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Oh Lord, we thank you that your word is just so, so deep and so full and so wonderful. Please would you work in our hearts and keep us and guide us. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, dear friends, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, I pray that you'd have a blessed, blessed Lord's Day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.